almost exactly five years ago on the 17th of December 2015, you found something absolutely extraordinary, a find of a lifetime in the Thames mud. Yeah, you were spot on. That was on the 17th of December 2015. A very cold afternoon. I wasn't sure what it was at first. Only when I arrived home and removed part of the mud, that's when I felt it was quite special. Hi everyone, today I'm on my way to meet my good friend and fellow mudlark Tobias Neto. Now Tobias found something absolutely extraordinary in the River Thames and he's going to tell me about that but first of all we're going to have a little mudlark together and see if we can find some pieces of history. So here he is, Tobias Nesso. Hi Tobias, how are you today? Nick, I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, I don't know, Captain. what's it like? Time and tide waits for no man. No. Yeah, so, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I've been uh, exploring a bit. It's really nice to be up here and it's such a lovely day. It's a lovely day, yeah. So are you hoping to find something? I'm hoping to find... Good today? Yes, nice rings today. Nice gold coins. Nice gold coins, yeah. Yes. Same here. <laughs> So let's hope that that's what we're going to do. Well, I have spotted a coin, but it's not a gold one, unfortunately. And it's not an ancient coin either, but it's still a coin. So that's a good sign. It's a 2p. It's a good omen. It might be a 5p look. Oh, yes. Well, there's a couple of things here. There is this curious looking shield shaped thing. What do you think that is? <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? It might have had something well, on it. Well, you see, once point. you clean that, yeah. you might be able to reveal something. It's quite interesting, that's isn't it? That's a keeper, definitely. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's really curious. And yes, Tobias has spotted part of a pipe there, look. It's broken, it's, a, um, it's going to be from the... It's going to be from the 1700s, that one. Hmm. So your first pipe of the day, Nick? First pipe of the day. Wouldn't be the same without a pipe, would it, really? Let's be honest. So when did you start mudlarking the Thames, Tobias? Mm -hmm. I've been mudlarking for about six years. I was given a metal detector in 2014. And also, back in 2014, because I started on this new hobby, I decided to create a Facebook group. And today, the Thames for Shore Finds has almost 5,000 members coming from different parts of the world. I think it might be uh, Georgian coin. Ooh, look at that! A Georgian coin! I think it is. Ooh, let's see. I think your eyesight is far better than mine, see? Nick. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, 1920. Which so is George That the is George fifth. The, the fifth. George the fifth. Oh, now I recognise this. This is a piece of Holloway's ointment, which was a cure, or rather a bit of a quack cure, back in the mid-19th century for all sorts of things, from sore breasts to headache to arthritis, everything you can think of. Everybody who was anybody had some Holloway's ointment. I've got a few larger pieces at home. The cure. 
for everything. seen a mangled piece of metal here. Turns out it's a bit of fork. Very nice. Oh, what's this? Alcurus Limited. I've not heard of that before. Alcurus Limited, eh? It's worth taking just so that I can find out a little bit about it. Ah, oh, now can you see what I'm looking at? It is a little bottle stopper look now isn't that pretty Now here's a pipe stem, but it's not my usual kind of pipe stem. This one is a later one and it's uh, one of the replaceable ones. It's made of, uh, what's it called, that um, first kind of plastic. I can't remember the name now. find bottles with your metal detector. <laughs> oh, it looks like a computer. Oh, no, like there is a signal right, right there. Ooh. Let's get rid of that. Oh look at that. Oh what a lovely bottle! That's a complete one. Yeah! Oh you're so clever Tobias. Your metal detector finds bottles. What's that then? Oh that is um liquid Something New York. Oh, let's have a look. Um, uh, I can hear. I can see. Damn. Da <laughs> fluid hair. Something. Yes. New York. Damn shiner. Oh. Damn shinky. Damn shinks. Oh, damn shinsky. Liquid hair dye. New York. What great bottle. I haven't seen one of those before. <laughs> that's amazing. No, let's let's find out what's here, shall we? Yes, now you can investigate the actual metal signal. Look at that, isn't that a great bottle? Brilliant. That was that wasn't it? There's something there. It might be absolutely nothing. Yeah, you never know. It might be something. It might be a coin, or a ring, yeah, some gold. Big lump of iron. Oh, is it that? Yeah. That's it. Oh. Anyway. But it found you this bottle. Found the bottle, yeah. Damn shit. Can't complain. Eh? Liquid hair dye, New York. What have you got there? I think it's a navy button. Shall we give it a wash? Yes, yeah, let's have a look and see okay. what it is. Let's go down. Oh, 
fire, let's see. Mm. Oh, well, that's interesting. I don't think it's the navy one. I see. Nice one. Yeah, that is nice. There's like there, there's a crown and uh Oh, you know what? Do you know what? I think that might be a light infantry badge. And that links very well with what we're going to talk about later on. Yeah. What a great find. It's only because I can see, can you see the bugle curling underneath the shield there? Yeah, yeah. Now this is extraordinary because I found, um, yeah, I found a pipe very, very similar with the same motif on. And that's how I know it's light infantry. It would be excellent to find out what regiment this is from. So I'm going to take a photograph of it now and put it on Twitter and see if anybody can help. But amongst all the pipes and bottle stoppers and pieces of beautiful glass and pottery, sometimes there's something extraordinary waiting to be found. On the 17th of December 2015, I found something that changed my life. I found a genuine Victoria Cross medal from the Crimean War. From the date 5th of November 1854 inscribed on the back, we know he must have belonged to one of two awarded soldiers, either John Byrne or John McDonough, both recommended for gallantry after the Battle of Inkerman. Because it's missing the suspended bar and the ribbon, we may never know whose medal it is, and the reason he ended up in the river. Well, as soon as I realized I had a VC medal, I contacted the Museum of London. Meanwhile, I started on my own research until I saw Kate Sumner, the Finance Liaison Officer at the time, in January 2016. And Kate Sumner helped me with the research. And um, so, yes, she was uh, my, um, my big helping hand at the time. It's the highest award a British soldier can receive. It had a date on the reverse, 5th of November 1854. And after a bit of research, I found out that the date related to the Battle of Inkerman during the Crimean War in 1854. That would have been one of the very first Victoria Cross awarded to a soldier in in those days. 16 Victoria Crosses were awarded for the Battle of Inkerman. Possible recipients could be Private John Byrne of the 68th Durham Light Infantry, he was from Ireland, and the other one was Private John McDermott of the 47th the Lancashire Regiment, and he was from Scotland. I couldn't trace any relatives of either men. I had some response from a Byrne family in, in Ireland, but that took us nowhere. Just a reminder that the Victoria Cross I found had no bar attached to it, no ribbon. And that is the mystery.
the Thames Victoria Cross has generated a lot of interest and one person in particular who's helped Tobias with his research is Gloria Winfield who is a keen military researcher and we're lucky enough to have Gloria here with us today and she's going to tell us a little bit about how she came to be researching the medal and also what she has found out about the two possible recipients Private John Byrne and Private John McDermott. So yes, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Uh, well, I discovered um, the VC find. Uh, it was to do with some publicity that the Museum of London had sent out. And I think it was possibly two years after Tobias found the medal. Both men were in the Battle of Inkerman, where they both were awarded uh, the Victoria Cross for bravery, for valour. Uh, this medal was um, set up Primarily, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had a great deal to do with this medal because there was a want for a medal that could be awarded to all men, not just officers. And they were one of the first, uh, these men, to be awarded that medal. But through time, these men have been ignored. So Tobias finding that medal has started all this research again. Uh, I start with uh, Private John McDermott of the 47th Regiment of Foot. Uh, John was born in 1828 in Clutmanon in Scotland. And luckily on the internet and on the military records, I actually found his attestation papers of when he joined up in the 1840s. Um, he signed on in Glasgow and then went to Hull where the regiment was and then on to the Ionian Islands, Corfu and then on to Malta, where he was prior to uh, the onset of the Crimean War. John McDermott had an interesting career in that he did get up to the, did get up to the rank of corporal, but gradually lost his stripes because uh, he did have an issue with discipline and drinking. When the regiment was sent to Malta in 1854, they were there about a month when they took part in the Battle of Alma, which is one of the first big battles and he was wounded twice. A couple of months after Alma, there was the Battle of Inkerman. And this is where John McDermott gained his VC by saving the life of his Colonel, O'Haley Grady. They then went on to take part in the ongoing Battle of the Siege of Sebastopol. The regiment returned after the Crimean War in 1856 to Gibraltar for a few months and then they went on to the UK and it was in South Sea in 1857 that McDermott was awarded his VC. They, during this period of being in England, he had his picture painted by William de Sange, the uh, French Chevalier, who was um, an up-and-coming painter of the time and had started to paint pictures of VC heroes. Now John McDermott then went on to Canada. Again there was trouble on the American uh, Canadian border. He was injured on the ship going out where he injured his right ankle and this proved to be problematic. He was sent back to um, England 10 months after he got to Canada and he was medically discharged at Chatham, which was one of our huge naval ports on the southeast coast. He then went up to London to Chelsea. Um, I mean, he was then identified as a Chelsea out pensioner. And they sorted out his pension papers, etc. And he was awarded nine pence in the old pennies. And then he went back to Scotland. In 1863, in October, he was back in Alloa marrying Margaret Watterson, who was about 20 years younger than John. She was a mill worker. And then they appeared to go back to the east end of Glasgow and lived in what they call in Glasgow the tenements in a very poor area with no running or piped in water. It hadn't quite reached those areas of Glasgow yet. The following year, they had a daughter, Joan. And two years later, in 18... 66 they had the son John and this was in the April. John McDermott died in the July of typhus which was endemic in the city, cholera, there was always epidemics breaking out. 
He was then buried in an unmarked grave in the eastern necropolis in Glasgow, which left his wife Margaret and two children destitute. Pension stopped immediately on the 19th of July. And rather ironically, his pension request to be increased had been granted to a shilling. And they had a week of that. There is a very slight confusion about his death because um, he did die in 1866. There's no doubt about this. Although you get many sites saying he died in 68 in poverty in the cause house. That's a lot of nonsense. He actually died in 1866 when he was 38, four years after leaving the army. He was buried, as I say, in an unmarked grave. I have no idea what happened to his three medals uh, that he certainly had or was awarded. So poor Margaret, a young 21-year-old, went to apply to poor law, which was, if you like, our pre-benefit system. She was turned down and told to go back to where she came from, which technically means, under poor law, that you are outside your area. I do wonder what happened to these medals. Were he buried with them as an old soldier? Did she have to pawn them for a loaf of bread? I was lucky enough to take on McDermott, and to the point of actually having it finally recognised in his home county uh, with a proper VC stone. Uh, which was a great honour for me to do. Um, and luckily, probably one of the last that the county will do because they only do them up to the World War I. And it was quite interesting to actually be, be a part of the last World War I veteran, VC holder. And John McDermott and he are side by side um, on this site. Um, and I felt John had come home in a way. It was, I thought, a fitting tribute to a man who'd done what he'd done, you know, probably the same as a lot of men, but he'd had such a very short, tragic life. So I then looked John Byrne. And John Byrne would appear to have been born in Castle Cooma in County Kilkenny. He joined up in the 68th Regiment of Foot, and this would have taken him to back to Ireland, to the UK, and then he went onwards to Malta prior to the Crimean War. Now, both he and McDermott were in Malta at the same time. Unfortunately, John Byrne had a problem with discipline. And he, I have recently found the records of his court martial where he was in a bar in Malta, obviously misbehaving and was told to leave by an officer. And then he turned on the officer and insulted him. So he was dealt with by the regiment, put in the military prison in Malta. And he was actually in the military prison for something between a year to 18 months. That was his sentence, which tells me he probably had more than one issue with discipline. He then, luckily, was two ways to look at this. He was released to go to the Crimea. So again, both he and um, McDermott ended up in the Crimea and would appear to have been in the same battles and it was at Inkerman that John Byrne excelled and was awarded one of the very first VCs. After the Crimean War ended, the regiment would appear to have had some r and &R time, but they were then sent out to New Zealand because the Maori Wars had started and they were involved in quite heavy, vicious fighting. Now, when you think of what these men have gone through in the Crimea, you know, it was an ill-prepared army. The men suffered deprivation terribly, but still fought on and were heroes. John Byrne, in the New Zealand Wars, excelled again and was awarded a DCM, which is one step down from a VC. They were in uh, New Zealand for some time, and then after New Zealand, they were sent to what we call Straits, which was Burma, India, 
Malaya, all the way down to Singapore. And there was lots of horrible things going on there. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened. We can surmise that Byrne had all these terrible things happening. And he appeared to have ended up in the lunatic asylum in the Straits. He was there for some time. Then he appeared back in the UK between 1871 and 1872 through um, Southampton was sent to Temple Moor in Ireland where the regiment was, and that's when he was discharged as a pensioner. He then appeared to go back across the Irish Sea to Durham, where he joined the North Durham Militia. He didn't last very long because his insubordination again rose to the fore and they got rid of him. So between that period of time, say, 1872, 1873 to 1878, we don't know what Byrne was doing. But he turns up in 1878, late 1878, in Bristol, saying that his property and his belongings went, were lost in a fire. Now, he said Cork. There's no, I've, I've tried to research this, there's no, no, no records. So someone recognised him at the pension office in Bristol and he was given a job with the ordinance. Unusually given a job because he was older than most of the men. He was in his 40s. So he, he was given this job and he went to work in Newport. And he was under the ordinance uh, department, which was actually... Uh, run by the Royal Engineers. He was there until, obviously up to his death in 80, July 1879. But a few months before his death, there was a request that came down from the War Office, Minister of Defence now, from a colonel asking Lieutenant Barclay, who was literally his officer in charge, what state of mind was he in? And Barclay apparently replied, well, he seems fine. Well, it's only that we have his VC here in London. And we'd like to know that if he's mentally stable, we want to give him the medal back. Because in those days, they could actually take the VC off of men for misdemeanors or whatever. It wasn't until uh, King George the... Yes, I think it was the Queen's Garden. Yeah, I think it was King George V made a ruling that no VC can be taken off a man for whatever. So they have the VC forever. Barclay gave the OK that Byrne seemed fine and the VC was sent down to Wales. Now, when this issue came up in the July of 1879, when he allegedly had had an issue with one of his colleagues which had been fine up till that day and felt he'd been insulted his medal had been insulted his his military service had been insulted he went off almost in a tangent um acting very strangely uh you know throwing his medals down the table in his uh, boarding house in front of his landlady saying he wasn't going to put up with this could he have the knife off the wall that she had on the wall then he said, I'm going to Cardiff. And he went off to Cardiff. He arrived back at his lodgings that evening, still a bit disturbed, went to work the next day, early in the morning. And this is when he took out the bulldog gun that he bought, would, would appear to have bought in Cardiff, and shot at Mr. Watts. Then he took off back to his lodging house and there, the police were called, uh, there was a siege, he wouldn't come out. He gave them till three o'clock. He said, I'll, I will come out at three. And at 3 p.m., the two policemen, the sergeant and the constable turned up. And sadly, John Byrne committed suicide by the gun that he'd bought. Mm -hmm. Sadly, 
he was portrayed as being a lunatic. But you know, when we look at military history and we look at today what's happened in wars that we've had recently, battle weary, war weary, um, PTSD, that's probably what he was suffering from, flashbacks. Whatever was going on in John Byrne's mind, we will never know, but he did commit suicide. We have no record of who buried him. Was it a pauper's funeral? We don't know. No idea what happened to the medals. And apart from a plaque in the market square in Castle Kuma that recognises that he is a VC hero, there's little out there about him. Yes. But one of the things that I found, as I've previously mentioned, that I have this thing with Byrne is the medal was only given to him two months before he died. So whose medal could it possibly be? The supposition is, you know, it's 50-50 and that's what we've always gone with. What happened to Dick McDermott's medals? There's no trace of them. Nothing has ever turned up. I sometimes wonder if the medal is McDermott because he did go to London. But it's been a, a remarkable journey so far and it's not over yet. My feeling is that the medal belonged to Private John Byrne, who possibly on a trip down to London decided to get rid of his Victoria Cross and then he threw it in the River Thames. But that's my gut feeling. I've managed to visit the, the burial place in Wales where Private John Byrne was buried. So that was a very uh, moving moment which I, which I shall treasure. Maybe because he's my suspect number one, but if I have a chance one day I will go up to Scotland and see where John McDermott was buried as well. The Victoria Cross Medal or the Thames VC as it's now known is now kept with the National Army Museum in London. Having a letter from Her Majesty the Queen was quite special and very rewarding. I've been back to the very same spot on the anniversaries. It's going to be now the fifth anniversary. With the hope that the bar will be there and the ribbon, who knows, and then we can solve this mystery. Having said all that, um, the mystery, I think, becomes even more interesting because either one of them is the recipient of the Thames VC. Their act of bravery is remembered as it gives all of us a chance to honour both soldiers, both of their memories. <laughs>